this was another finalist of the supercomputing uh, movie thing uh, a few years ago. This was done with Visit, actually. So we've talked a lot about Paraview today, but Visit also has some fantastic features. And I did this because Visit has an interface to the NEC 5000 code. It's a code from Argon, and it's a spectral code. That's the, uh, the big differentiation with it. And what Visit does, it does a tetrahedralization of the uh, spectral elements, which gives, me po which gives me then the ability to do the volume rendering on one side and then the uh, polygonal display on the other. This is also the fruit of several months of scripting and scratching my head and redoing the visualization. Uh, Visualization is not easy, okay? Let's, let's be honest. <laughs> it looks fancy when it's done, but it takes a lot of, a lot of efforts. Now, uh, the volume rendering that you see on the right side here is CPU-based in Visit, and it, it's very difficult to fine-tune to make it efficient and to not waste too many resources. It's e what I'm saying is that it's easy to actually overdo it, allocate way too many resources for a result that it's just not worth, uh, worth the allocation. So it takes some, some benchmarking. That's actually one of the other thing I do a lot for the users, benchmarking the resource allocation to, to get a fair allocation of what is really needed, because people also don't like to waste their budgets, right? And then once the benchmark is done with multiple uh, scenarios, I, I am able to uh, launch the full, the full uh, visualization. I'm going to start now with this uh, PowerPoint. I'm a little bit confused. Is it in? Ah, okay. All right, good. Slide. Okay. <clears throat> this afternoon, we're going to start with the following things. We're going to show you what I, I called two days ago when Berlin and I were doing the final touches on the tutorial. We called it the classic way of doing in suit in situ to differentiate it with Sensei, which is now this umbrella which allows you to drive your in situ with multiple backends. The, what I call the classic way, like this, out of, out of the lack of a better, better term, is uh, using one and only one in situ library. So this afternoon, I will show you Libsim, which is the library of Visit, integrated into Visit. And then we'll have a second part showing you Catalyst. Now, why are we showing those two classic methods? It's because there are lessons to learn on the, for example, the, the script that you want to give to Sensei to execute each of those back ends. So unless you know already what the application does, it's pretty difficult to, out of the air, think up a scenario of visualization and derive a visualization pipeline for what you want to see. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with this example, which uh, we will use also tomorrow during the exercise. It's a 2D uh, Poisson solver for the heat equation, something very simple. The purpose of it was not to demonstrate some fancy physics. The purpose of it was not to implement a very fast solver. In fact, I, I say it uh, teasing. The slower it is, the better, because when I do tutorials, I want things to move. I don't want the simulation to run too quickly. Otherwise, I'm already converged, and I have nothing to see. So, very simple implementation of this Poisson solver. I have written the code in three languages. 
Python, Fortran, and C. The code is in the contributed directory of the visit software. So you, you will find it in their repo. And then I have some updated versions here, which eventually I will contribute again back to, uh, to visit. But basically the starting point is there in all three languages. So you can pick the language you prefer. <coughs> We're solving on a two-dimensional grid in parallel, so we need ghost cells. I've said that a few times already today. Everybody's familiar, comfortable with the concept of ghost cells, right? Yes? Okay, good. In C2, so we have to do a number of things. Do the source code, what we call the source code instrumentation. So start from an existing solver code base and add the glue. The, we will call it also the data bridge later on to interface to the solver. Specify the ghost node and then we will step through the execution of the code. There's a picture. So it's 2D. There's the address for the uh, contributed code. I've said all this already. C Python and this was contributed in 2011. Since 2011, I have not done any Fortran. That's how often I use it. But I made the effort to code something in Fortran so that the example would be available for everybody. This is my grid. Those are the boundary conditions. On step zero, I initialize my grid like this. I have a fixed boundary condition, of course, and then a the internal nodes are being updated by the, uh, by the solver. I can use multiple partitionings. In fact, this title is kind of misleading. misleading. In, in MPI terminology, this is not called a 2D partitioning. What I really meant was the partitioning of the 2D grid. This is a 1D partitioning. The example you will work on tomorrow, same code base, the partition, partitioning is 2D, which means that I divide the global dimension in four pieces like this. So I have lower left, lower right, upper left, upper right. And then you can add multiple ranks if you want. In that case, OK, the boundary conditions are set. This is a standard five-point stencil computation. And of course, right there, at the boundary between processors, we need to exchange ghost cells. That line from, process, from the green processor needs to be uh, traded with the blue processor and vice versa. Checkpointing and restart. I do it like this. Uh, why so is because you need to be able to restart with any number of MPI ranks. So your internal storage on disk for the checkpoint should not be fixed on a particular number of, of ranks. So for the two extreme, I actually write MP plus one grid lines. For the internal ones, I, I write MP lines and then again, for the top grid, I write MP plus one. Now, in the context of in situ, writing the solution to disk is still an option. Furthermore, it's more than just an option. It's also a prerequisite in the sense that I'm going to use one of the solution. I usually take the final solution after convergence which I store to disk, I will normally store it at low resolution. In other words, I can run a small MPI job with a low resolution grid, converge, dump the solution to disk, and I use this then to derive the scenarios for the in situ uh, visualization. So I still need to know how to write my solution to disk. That's the message. 
the Gauss data exchange. I have an, a cute little animation here to show how it's done. Overlap, send and receives. Process is zero at the base, doesn't get anything from below, and, and same thing for the top processor. I have a buffer array called V new. This is called, this is the temporary buffer. I exchange my ghost cells, and then what I visualize is actually the array called V. On exit, the two arrays are converged, copied to the identical, and I save them to disk. Okay. Uh, I'm kind of stuck here. In, there we go. Now, visit. Here's how the libsim will operate. I have my simulation code here running on multiple nodes on the supercomputing cluster. I'm going to add, I'm going to link to it a small static library, which is, if you want, a runtime loader for visit. And that runtime loader will, be, will only be executed if I decide to do the in, the, the in situ instrumentation. In other words, once instrumented, the code can actually run standalone. The connection to the visualization app is not obligatory. With this small runtime, with this small static library used for the runtime, once I connect, the, the rest of the visits, if you want, uh, executable and libraries are loaded in memory. In other words, in the, me the memory space here is shared between the simulation code and the visit executable. The visit GUI is going to send commands to the uh, parallel server, and then images will be sent back to the viewer and the graphical user interface. Most often, data will be shared via pointers, so zero copy, but there are always Especially in those early times, this is now, Lipsims is now, uh, I guess, seven, eight years old. In those early times, uh, there was no zero copy, the so-called zero copy interface in VTK implemented. So there were still situations where we had to do double copies in memory. This was actually one of the criticism when I presented that in early years, uh, oftentimes, there were people telling me, we up to here already with the memory on the node, we cannot afford to load any more code in the memory space of the, of the uh, application. Berlin mentioned this morning other scenarios where you can do in-transit visualization, where you have a dedicated resource which will actually receive data from the main computational resource, and then do the visualization on the fly on a secondary resource. In that case, you wouldn't pay the, the, the price of sharing your memory space. The execution flow is, is, uh, is the following. On a regular basis, but you're not obligated to do it at every step of your simulation, you check for visualization request. First of all, you're going to check, is there an application connect, wanting to connect to my simulation? If not, I just go ahead and compute until convergence. If there is a request, I connect, and then once connected, we're back to the discussion of this morning the simulation code needs to advertise what it is, what is it that it's computing. Mesh types, number of blocks, n name, number of variables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <coughs> this is a lightweight uh, communication. Again, just very simple metadata. We provide the pointers to the data. 
or wrap them into the expected form and shape. That's the discussion about vector fields maybe are strided in x, y, and z direction, or they are x, y, z, x, y, z as tuples. Those discussions have to be taken place, have to take place. In the source code example I have provided, it's very simple. There's a compile flag. If they visit, there's the instrumentation code. Otherwise, you can compile the straight standalone version of the solver. So there is the application flow. This would be your typical simulation. Initialize your code, read the checkpoint, whatever it is, solve. There are some criteria for convergence, for, for exiting, or, and then you iterate. So actually, in, in that scenario, in situ would work if you have multiple iteration in your solver. Uh, I've had uh, one person come with a solver that said, oh, I, only, I have a single iteration. Well, what does that mean? It means that actually deep down there are iterations, and that's where it becomes some of the effort might be in reformulating your execution flow in the original solver such that you express out iterative calls to certain functions. And in that case, you can do that scenario. So with libsim, you have this as a classic model. And then <clears throat> we're going to insert this particular request. And that seems like a big piece of code. In the examples I have, uh, it's 50 lines of code, really something simple. And all the contributed example in the visit uh, um, distribution, it's, it's that same 50 lines of code, uh, which you use once and you can reuse multiple times. So establish the connection between the client and the simulation, process the commands, and then optionally process also console input. All right, normally simulation would just go run. In the tutorial, I usually start and then stop immediately at time steps zero or one, just so that I have time to explain how things go. All right. In the examples, we're going to stop at it after each time step. So we have the ability to request multiple plots. So here's the graphical user interface. How many of you have used Visit already? Three. Good. Four, whatever, uh, half of you. Visit is a great tool, OK? I've talked a lot about uh, Paraview already this morning, but they're really a very equivalent system, large scale, etc. They have a ve very attractive, uh, both of them have a very attractive execution model. There are, as often, pros and cons for maybe for perhaps a specific scientific field, visit will be better. For another one, Paraview will be better. It's kind of a choice. This is also the type of discussion I do with my users. The graphical user interface of visit looks like this, uh, a main panel, a window, and you can have several rendering window. A simulation panel, which you would activate when you do the in situ uh, connection. And then some uh, feedback windows here. Now, I have some slides from Alan Sanderson, actually. Alan is a colleague from University of Utah who is most likely the person who has developed the most sophisticated interface for the Ski Utah, UINTA solver infrastructure being driven with LibSIM He's got a very elaborate uh, graphical user interface, which is to say that the basic visit 
interface is going to give you a, a pretty simple way of interacting with the code. Stop, hold, restart, etc. Just the very basic. But you can add a lot more controls to it to feed back to your simulation and so forth. So Alan Sanderson at University of Utah would be the absolute best contact if you want to learn how to do a, a large scale graphical user interface command uh, panel for your simulation. There are basically three, four, yeah, functions you need to implement to follow the visit API, data API. Get, me get metadata. This is the exchange of the metadata information between the simulation and visit. Get mesh, get scalar, get vector. Those are pretty explicit names. What does this get mesh do? It's, it actually means provide the VTK object for your local partition. Okay? And the arguments to get mesh is, if I recall correctly, the MPI rank and then the block ID number. So you can have, as expected, multiple blocks per rank, etc., and then you manage all of this. Scalars and vectors are pretty explicit. Yeah. Now, because this is point-based, to do the in-situ graphics, I actually have, you see, one extra index here for the for the contribution of each rank to the graphics. Otherwise, I would have had a blank space here, one cell width empty between each of the, each of the uh, partition. So in my rectilinear mesh set, the real indices, those are the indices I use here for a to describe my data. By the way, there is a, a, a small distinction here about visit. Visit does not, hand, does not support, per se, the VTK image data, as we saw it this morning. The discussion it goes back from many years ago at the early days of visit. It was decided that the rectilinear mesh was a good approximation. It takes little extra memory in any case to describe a, a truly Cartesian regular grid as a rectilinear mesh. So there, that's to be known. Visit supports rectilinear mesh, curvilinear mesh, and unstructured, and of course, multi-blocks. There we go, ghost, ghost nodes. In visit, in your, the description of the API, I can also specify which of my grid line here are ghost zones so that visit can take appropriate measures to uh, exchange the data. There is my, there is my, uh, my global workflow now. The execution of the next step can be triggered either by the normal program flow or on demand, single stepping via the process uh, visit command interface console. Let's look at examples. So how much impact in the source code? If you have large contiguous memory arrays, in that case to store mesh coordinates, if they are stored as tuples, which is the initial implementation in VTK, then you can use directly that array as a point. You can pass that point in memory to visit. And there is, in, in the API, the distinction between who has the responsibility to allocate and deallocate the memory. And there's this particular flag. For example, here I allocate a Fortran array a two-dimensional Fortran array, and I say the simulation owns the data pointer. What does it mean? It means that the 
on the in-situ side, on the, on the visit side, visit as with access to that memory pointer, but nothing else, which, which is fine. Visit is not going to disturb your simulation data. It's only going to read it. So I set my distance for double. I set my data set with a particular handle. The simulation owns that pointer. This is the size of my array, and that's the name of the array. And this one, I believe, means this is a scalar array. List, suit, list suited codes would be, I have a code like this in uh, SPH, astrophysics. You know how they, they like to allocate big, large array for the X coordinate, then the Y, then the Z. So your particles have a, is actually accessed through, through three independent arrays in memory. That doesn't fit the current model, so you have to reshuffle the data in, uh, in memory before passing it to visit. This would be, this is taken from, from a code I had, an unstructured code, an unstructured code. For the number of elements plus the number of halos or ghost cells, I had to compute this element list. Again, this is the topology connectivity list, which we discussed this morning, and then pass this to visit. In that particular case, this is the opposite. Earlier, we saw the flag where the simulation owned the pointer. In the case of, an, of a new array, which I have to instantiate and fill up only for the purpose of the visualization, in that case, I tell visit A, visit owns that pointer. As soon as visit is done doing the visualization with it, it can deallocate that pointer and free up the memory. So there's this, there's this nice distinction between who owns what part of the memory. <clears throat> what is implemented basically Anything that you see in the standard way of using visit when you read data from disk, you can do it in situ. So polyhedral material species, MR, multi-block, et cetera, scalars, vector tensors, all of those things you can do in situ. And I repeat, connecting in situ does not mean you, can, you need to throw away your, your I.O. You, you still need this for at the minimum for checkpoint and restart. The merits of the approach, you, have, you can eliminate the greatest bottleneck of the disk I.O. if you want. And really, if, you would, if I would compute how many hours I spend converting, deciphering file formats, all this is gone. You have the data in memory, you access data through your pointers. You don't worry about file formats anymore. Often, we'll see that also Friday, Paraview or Visit have to generate ghost data on the fly based on the filters that you use in your pipeline. That generation can be heavy. If you run with the code, with the live code, the ghost cells are there already. So no need to reconstruct that. There's a great benefit of the in-situ approach. Potentially, all the time steps are available. If you've done big I.O. with your simulations, you know that oftentimes you're going, you're going to save the disk only one every 10 or 100 time steps or 1,000 time steps, whatever, because you can't afford it. With in-situ, basically, any time step is available as long as it's in memory. Any variable is available. Oftentimes, the climatology people are, I point to in your direction, they're the most famous for saving hundreds of variables. My gosh. 
terabytes, petabytes, etc. Other people restrict themselves to the fundamental velocity, pressure, temperature, density, variables, and then if you need more, you need to derive them again. Or here, with your solver, all variables in memory are available. So it's actually also very useful for debugging purposes. If you have some temporary variable which you use for debugging, you can access them through in situ. There we go. So I think we all sold anyway on the idea of in situ. This uh, summarizes some of the merits of the approach. Now, we're going to switch to, unfortunately, I had forgotten this, this uh, presentation on my laptop. So we had to use, do, to use two laptops. I will reintegrate those slides into the deck, into the original deck for the, uh, for the documentation. I'm going to take that off to avoid accidents. OK, good. Yeah, we're good. We're good with that. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Berlin. So, uh, yes, please. Uh, in, in the case where the simulation core owns the data, are you sure? How do we make sure that the data is still in memory while this is still processing it? Uh, because the, the fact is that the execution engine of visit is sharing not only the memory space, but also the execution resource of the node means that you either compute or visualize, but you don't do both because your CPU. Actually, you can do both in visit and we had this problem when we instrumented warp yeah. and we were using python uh, to control the visit uh, visualizations in visit um, the python commands get executed in a separate thread oh and the so threads yeah we had to add some synchronization um, okay. into you know our code to say okay don't let visit do anything else here because as soon as you send that python command visit returns control to you so in uh, some yeah. case, maybe in the cases you were doing, it was synchronous. Yeah. But if you start using the Python stuff, it becomes asynchronous. And then you have to really be careful because then all of a sudden your simulation computed the next time step visits in the middle of doing something and you get this like chaos in your visualization. Great, thanks. Berlin is by far more expert in Python than I am. And this is a very good precision. Yeah, uh, so we have to keep that in mind. I'm going now to go to the example. We're going to, we have this, the example on the virtual machine. You're going to be able to exercise it. I'm going to show you. I'm going to run the example, connect visit to it, then clean up my cache, recompile, link with Catalyst, do again the second scenario, coupling the example with Catalyst. So. Uh, OK, that's good like that. I think, oh my gosh, I started from, I'm all at the, uh, here we go. For this demonstration, it works best to use the domain decomposition as it is. We use four contiguous zones, four MPI ranks. It works best. This is a, a mini app. This is a demo. Uh, there's nothing sophisticated about checking that the partitions are equally weighted, that there's no, there's no one cell off problems, etc. So don't change those things. Four, Four zones, four tasks is, is a good demo for the case. 
because we're going to repeat this for different back ends, it's a good idea to start with cleaning the cache, the CMake cache. So it's usually sufficient to clean up the cache and the CMake files directory. You remove those. First scenario, visit. On the virtual machine, we load the module, the visit module. We export that particular visit, uh, that particular variable to be the installation directory of visit because the CMake list, which I had prepared already years ago, uses that variable. Uh, and for historical purposes, I did want to, to break the examples contributed on the visit website. I compile it like this with CMake with a couple of flags in situ coupling on, and then the flag use libsim boolean, of course, on. And then don't forget the dot here at the end. So space and dot. This means the current directory here. Uh, now, I have a cup, I have three flags in the CMake list file. The use libsim, libsim as a Boolean, the use catalyst as a Boolean, and then the third one, which is actually in situ coupling. I can turn that off altogether, and if I do so, I compile the straight standalone version of the code without any coupling. It runs to the end, dumps a file, and that's it. You can use this as a verification that the solver has executed to the end. If compiled in that particular manner, I make it. I have an executable called pjacobi underscore visit, and I run this with four tasks uh, in the example. Once I do this, in the context of visit, there is a small file with the <coughs> suffix dot sim2, which is a specific file format, if you want, or, or file prefix to indicate to visit that the content of the file is not a data set per itself, but it's information on how to connect to a running simulation. And I should. And we look at the file, the file content. If you are locally, we're going to do this on our, our virtual box, the, the content of this file will be something like localhost, I believe. Is that true? Yeah, I think. Anyway, it gives you the ID of where the simulation runs. If you do everything on your box, the host is a localhost. And it gives you. A, a password to actually connect. So if you were to run this on Pete's date, your simulation on Pete's date and the visit GUI at your desk at ETH Zurich or wherever you are, uh, it, would, it would give the full IP address of the compute node and then visit through SSH tunnels would go through and connect to the server uh, on that side. So we're going to need two windows to do this on the first terminal, run npi exec minus n for the name of the execu executable. And we're going to see for each task the message libsim initialize. <coughs> on a second terminal window, module load visit again. And the file created is exactly this, pjacobi.sim2. This is five lines of information basically, which you load into visit using the standard minus O flag. We need to add a slide with the content of this side for the next time. This would be much simpler to, uh, to, to do. Oh, okay, then, all right, so uh, demonstration. Demonstration, there we go. Uh, I, need, I need my glasses because the font is very small here. All right. Module. Oh. 
Jean, that's Hurt? not the VM. That's oh. a uh, that's oh, a terminal no. on the laptop. Oh yeah, it's not. Uh, the VM is. Try, try the alt command. You should be able to switch to it that way. Alt tab or? Yeah. Oops. Uh huh. It's interesting. Oh, did it? Did I don't it, know. I don't know what happened. Did it go in the standby maybe? It went into standby, I guess. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, that's nice. All right. So when that comes back, Good. you okay. should. OK, couple of seconds. You should be OK. We're on standby, all right. I'll quit. Oh, the, big, the, the VM noticed the battery was low, I guess. Ah, yeah. Oops. All right. OK, we're here. Excuse me? Where can we download the slides? We saw the, mo the module commands this morning. Here, because I had pair view and different things, I'm going to, I want to clean up. I want to start from scratch. You can use the command module purge. That gives you a nice, clean environment. There we go. CSCS, Institute, Jacobi, Sensei, C. Oh, wait, wait. No, that's the Sensei instrumented version. Oh, no, you're right. You want the classic one, right? Yes, very good. Classic is here. So there's classic. That's what you get in this distribution and a module load visit. Ah, I should have saved that to make it faster. Module show visit export visit home equals this. Now I'm just going to run CC make, which is equivalent configure. I turn in C2 coupling on. It's already on. I turn libsim on. So it's a single switch. Hit the return key, and it switches to the other option. And you configure G to generate the code, and you make it, and that's it. So I have two executable. I have P Jacobi, which is the standalone solver, your original code if you want. And then I have the instrumented version, P Jacobi underscore visit. I'm going to run. MPI exec minus N four dot slash PJ Kobe. Very good. MPI. Okay. That's the content of my slides. The, those little diagnostic here are the dimensions of the so called Cartesian MPI partitioning. So it's a two by two partitioning. I need a second window. Module load visit CD CSCS in situ Jacobi classic there there's the content of the the famous file okay so my host is actually called yeah it, it can it's either local host or the host name here sensei dash sc17 dash zero one it's going to communicate on that particular port and then those are comments used for further development it turns out even to do the demo on your own laptop if you have all network interfaces off it's not going to work i was caught up by this once i had to actually turn on the wi-fi just so that it could connect to itself. That's, that's something to know. So this is the file I'm going to run. I'm going to open with visit. Visit minus O P Jacobi dot sim 2. And there I am. Now, 
For those of you, are we still? Yeah. For those of you not knowing the visit interface, the first panel I'm opening here is the file information panel, and it shows that I have a mesh called mesh partitioned into four blocks, and I have one scale field called temperature. And that's it. And that's the meta information. <clears throat> so the solver has communicated to the GUI that is the data available. And now, I start with an empty pipeline. This is often a question we see on the mailing list of visit. I loaded my data, and I see I don't see anything. It's because the data is not actually loaded. The file was opened, but the data wasn't read. Because visit lets you build up the full pipeline and then start the execution. So I can add now a filter called pseudo color of temperature. And when I said draw, it's the same thing as saying apply. And there I have my grid. And I've stopped at time step one. I don't, I'm not attached here, good. So I really have the boundary condition here that was initialized and that's all. Everything else is zero, it's the color blue. I think we're good for the moment. And I have a panel and the controls called simulation there. No, sorry, simulations, or is it in the file, simulation, there we go. I have here the basic, if you want, interface to my simulation. So it shows again that I have four processors connected to me, and I can now run, stop, restart my simulation, and I'm going to run it. <clears throat> And there we go. My code is executing and sending updates. And we are slowly now converging to the uh, final solution, which I think you've seen on the slide already. There. So let me stop this. Let me hold. There. I can actually disconnect completely, let the simulation continue to run, go back tomorrow, reconnect to it, it's pretty robust. Normally, there's no, you can do this multiple times. Now, the advantage of this approach is that <clears throat> when I started, I started with, a, with an empty pipeline. Now, if you tell me, I'm not interested in showing the, the colorful graphics here. I want to see a histogram of my scalar field. I say, OK, no problem. I'll do an histogram. So. Here's the example, histogram, temperature, draw. There's my histogram. Of course, I've, I've just barely initiated the, the computation, so most of the data here is along the uh, x equals 0 axis. The lesson to learn here is that I don't have to have a predefined visualization pipeline to start coupling visit with my simulation. On the fly, I can say, hey, I want a histogram. OK, I don't want this anymore. I cancel it. I want ISO, ISO contour lines. I can do ISO contour lines, and so forth, and so on. All right? So this really lets you do data discovery, data, data uh, testing, etc. And I'm in pause mode here for the simulation, just because, again, this is a tutorial. I need to explain things, and I don't want the code to go too far ahead. Now, if I, rest, if I continue, run, uh, we see multiple things happening. The histogram here, as you see, is being updated. Time step cycle is being updated. Everything here is on the GUI is receiving new inputs from <coughs> from visit. Let me halt again. I'm going to, is it on a single window? Yeah, I guess so. There is my, my data. I'm going to show you one more little trick. 
and then we will stop probably with visit. <coughs> Who does what? Where are my MPI task? Visit has a predefined keyword called proc ID, processor ID. <coughs> so instead of coloring by temperature, I'm going to color by processor ID. What do you expect to see? Four quadrants with four different colors. Let's see if this is, uh, <coughs> if this is true. I'm going to create an expression new that, that bug that's been there in visit for years, when you click and it does multiple unnamed expression, I'm going to call this proc ID. This is the name of my expression. And inside the panel here, I'm going to use the predefined keyword proc ID. Proc ID. And it needs the name of a mesh. And visit con conveniently here gives you access to the variable names and the mesh names. So I'm going to pull from that menu the correct name of the variable. Meshes. It's called mesh with a small m. I say apply, and I say dismiss. And at this point, I have in my list of variables a new variable called proc ID. If I click on it, there it is. I have my <coughs> four colors. This is using a 2D MPI partitioning. I'm debugging my solver. I want to understand what's going on with my ghost zones. Well, I, that was one of my arguments. I don't have to compute ghost zones. They are there already in the uh, code. So I simply use the operator inverse ghost zone and draw. And here I have exactly what I expected, a one cell with, with or, or, or depth of data with the content of the uh, exchange zone. It's, it's all blue for the moment because we haven't converged to anything uh, really useful. I'll get rid of this. I'll draw. I'll switch variable back to temperature. And I'll let it run. <clears throat> and that's basically the, the demonstration. Now, here I use the graphical user interface to create a histogram, create a pseudo color map of temperature. I'm going, I'm going to need the, name, the names of those commands for the in situ interface. How do I get those? Uh, there are multiple, multiple ways to do it. Let me halt this again for the moment and launch the command line interface. The, the CLE command line interface is the Python interface to the server, to the visit server. And in that command interface, I can also use I forgot a controls command. Oh, command, yeah. That's the one. I'll just say record. And visit is going to print out the Python code it uses to generate those visualizations. So for the purpose of the demonstration, I'm going to delete uh, delete that display of pseudo color and then I'm going to recreate one. I'll say record here. I'll say add mesh pseudo color temperature. I'll also do add contours. Where are they? Contours of temperature. I'll say draw. And you can see here that I have both the pseudo color map and the ISO contour here as lines of temperature. And if I stop my solver, I have here the three magic lines, if you want, 
in Python, add plot with the name pseudo color. Yeah, pseudo color, variable temperature. Add a second plot, contour with temperature, and then the command draw plots. Those names are exactly the names we're going to, we're going to use. In the same say, XML specification to say once visit connects to Sensei and executes visit, once the simulation connects via Sensei to visit, it's going to use those commands to generate uh, plots. All right? So again, we don't have to read the whole manual and learn about every possible visualization and their names to be able to get started. We tell visit to give us the Python code for it. And with those, step by step, incrementally, you can gain knowledge of the interface and know what to uh, put into your code. The exact same code here, the, this Python code, would be the code you would use in a batch-oriented visualization. You would feed visit a Python script with exactly those commands. Good. I'm done with visit. My simulation, well, it's, it's pausing now, but if I dismiss this and go back to my simulation, it would run again. And slowly but surely, it would update those, uh, the cycle number and the visualization, et cetera. This was a high-speed introduction into visit. Any questions? Are there some uh, benchmarking results available for the cost of uh, in-situ visualization? Yes. Um, in different ways. I recall that when we published the Lipsyn paper in 2001, we had a section on, on uh, at the time, I had instrumented Gadget, which is an astrophysics application from, is it? It's MPI uh, Max Planck Institute in Garking, right? The Gadget code? famous, well-known astrophysics code from uh, Max Planck Institute in Germany. I had instrumented uh, LIPSIM, the code gadget with LIPSIM, and I had some preliminary cost of the data interface. Since then, there has been other benchmarks made. Uh, the most recent is actually the data from Brad, Brad Whitlock, who has instrumented the code AVF, AVF Leslie, mm -hmm. with VISIT. He's got some measures of, yeah. of uh, We did some, cost. too, with uh, WARP. It's a laser plasma accelerator code. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it all depends what you're doing. You know, with VISIT, I think in our, in our WARP simulations, we were doing something like 20 different plots in analysis. We were doing uh, projections, like taking a 3D um, data field, projecting it down to 2D, you know, integrating over that. We were doing histograms. We were doing volume rendering. And uh, the simulation was something like 10x longer, you know, than the viz. So, you know, it's going to depend what you're doing and how often you're doing it. Um, but the actual, you know, transmitting the data into visit is very, you know, low overhead. And, and as Jean mm -hmm. showed, it can be done zero copy. Yeah. So, the other thing we had measured yeah. is actually at each iteration, we check if there are requests from the visualization from the GUI side. That check we had measured in terms of milliseconds. So it's really, OK, there's nothing to do. We go on. It's really uh, something extremely quick because there's very little data being uh, transferred over. Again, as Berlin said, the, there is some initial overhead for a given time step. But maybe that overhead can be amortized if you do multiple plots, etc. This is really a, a, a very simple example. Here, everything is kind of slow because we are doing for every time step, we're doing an update. You will see in the Sensei interface for each plot, and you can, you can have a certain, a given frequency of update of a given plot. So you can have multiple, multiple plot. One of them updates every 10 time step. 
One of them updates every 100 time steps, etc. So we really have all that flexibility to, uh, the idea is to not slow down the simulation too much, of course. Yeah. All right. I will stop with this. There is usually a disconnect button, which I often, by, I often bypass. I think it's clean now. Any other questions to, for visit cat for visit Lipsim? Uh, yes, uh, when I click help, yeah? uh, the CPU load is still 100%. Uh, this, is, this is an MPI thing. MPI, it does what's called a busy wait. It just pulls looking for communication because that's the absolute fastest way to do it. Yeah. Um, so you would have to reconfigure MPI, and so that's it, it, the simulation is actually not doing anything, but MPI is like doing this busy wait. Uh, you would need to recompile MPI from source, and when you compile MPI, you'll have to set a flag that says no busy waiting. MPI is not worried about power efficiency; it's worried about speed, but it has that ability to you know, be power efficient at the cost of performance, if you want it that way. We didn't take that in consideration when we built MPI for the VM. Yeah. I would just kill it if you're done with it and you're worried yeah. about your battery to die. All right. Next, I'm going to switch right up to a catalyst. So I clean up my cache. I module purge, hopefully without typo. I module load paraview. It's not my keyboard. And I see make again. Configure. This time I want catalyst on. And I say configure. Uh, exit. Configure. Generate. Make. And I now have a P. Jacobi catalyst instrumented, uh, where is it? Right here, executable. Now, this takes as input a Python script, which will build up the pipeline and also the description to give to, uh, to catalyst. So, how do you generate this uh, Python script? And we're going to look at it. I've made one, a simple one for you. And I'm going to go straight to the most important uh, features of that script. The class pipeline here, create a view with different attributes. Register that view with the coprocessor. Save images with the name image.png at a frequency of one, etc. And of, of, of course, all of this looks pretty complicated, but you don't have to write it yourself. That's the point. Don't get scared. Paraview Catalyst will write the code for you. I'm, I'm here only showing you the important features. So register the view. Uh, and then here we create a color transfer function for the variable called temperature. We show the data. So those, this is the syntax of the Paraview Python interface. We show the grid called Jacobi XMF in the particular view. In representation mode, slice. You could also switch to surface. As an exercise, you could switch to surface with edges. I think that's what it's called, right? So when you superimpose the wireframe on top of your grid. Anyway, just like in the case of visit, the standard Paraview pipeline, which you have when you say save state, that is the same syntax you would find here in this coprocessor routine. So there, it's actually simple to go from the standalone 
visualization 2D. Coprocessor Python script used by Catalyst. Finally, what's at the end here? Oops. Let me redo this. Uh, yes, the transfer function, the show command. OK, this is actually something I've added. The coprocessor, the catalyst code generator did not write that for me. Why did I do this? The idea is that you use a low resolution version of your output to load into Paraview. You build up a pipeline, and you save the script representative of that low resolution data. Now, if tomorrow I use this coprocessor script for, for a high resolution grid, it's mo it most of the time will not fit in the same area of, of the screen that I had for the low resolution data. <clears throat> so using reset camera, in this case, was just a simple way to say, hey, recenter the data right there. So I can use any resolution grid in my simulation. Paraview will just zoom. Paraview will reset on the global view. There, that's this for the pipeline itself. And then here, in the core processor class, we create the pipeline. And there, for the, in, for the input called input, we set a frequency of 1. What does that mean? It means that for every iteration, Paraview will save the image as specified. Your exercise will be to change that to different frequencies and see that Paraview will uh, do things in a different way. <clears throat> I have one more button, one more line of code here, which is interesting. Enable live visualization. By def in that particular case, I set the default to be false, which means I'm going to run my solver and in an independent way, it will save the images to disk and not allow me to interact with the data. If I turn live on, I can use the GUI of Paraview and interact with the running simulation. I can set breakpoints, for example, and have multiple visualization scenario to test. There, that's basically it. The rest is the glue, which Catalyst writes for us. We don't have to worry so much about the, the detail for the immediate uh, purpose. Note that I'm going to connect to localhost on port 22,000, etc., which means if I change that to a remote server or to pits daint in the machine room, I would connect to a simulation in the machine room on that particular port. Let's do it. So that coprocessor is there. Let's run it. MPI exec minus n4 dot slash Jacobian underscore catalyst coprocessor dot pi. Uh, yeah, OK, we're good. So catalyst initialized four times, four tasks. And now it's just simulating, dumping data to disk. I'm going to stop before it fills up the disk. Uh, and that's it. Because we are in a mode where the live visualization was not enabled. Eh? Uh, there. Guess what? It's filled up my disk with a bunch of images. What's the thing to images PNG? And Uh, yeah, I could have done something a little bit smarter, which was to look at every other 10 images, for example. Oh, 
Oops. What's the four minus those? Uh, star zero dot. OK, all right. I think you, you got the idea. So I've done a pseudo color plot of temperature with the given uh, color table here, blue to red, which is kind of kind of boring. So now, this coprocessor code I had as a, as a primitive pipeline, you can add to it. You wouldn't have to go through the whole operation again of generating the plugin. If you know a minimum of the syntax of Paraview, you know how to identify your data sources, your filters. You can add, for example, the contour filter in the middle of your pipeline, show it, and then you would have superimposed on your pseudo color map the, the uh, ISO contours. What I'm going to show you now is uh, we're going to do this. Run, first of all, clean up the disk, images PNG. I'm going to run MPI exec. I'm going to run the standalone version of the solver. This, there, it's done. So it's very quick, very low resolution. It saves two files. One of them is the final solution, the converge solution called jacobi.bov. This is good for visit to read. BOV means block of values. And it says an XMF file, which refers also to the binary block. And I'm going to read this with Paraview. So this would be the idea. Run at low resolution, dump a representative example of your data grid, load it into Paraview, create a visualization. Once you like it, tell Catalyst to write the coprocessor code. I'm going to demonstrate exactly that uh, now. So let me show you the content of jacobi.xmf. It's nothing, nothing fancy. Attribute name temperature, scalar, center at the node. Dimension is 200 square times one because it's a 2D float, double, double length float. The binary data is jacobi.bin. Spacing, origin, dimensions. It's exactly the keywords we've, we've talked about this morning already, the description of the grid. And it's a uniform grid. Paraview, whoa, Paraview, Jacobi XMF. There. Let me resize things a little bit. Ah, I'm resizing the. All right. Whoa. No, that's not the button I want. There's my data. Well, by default, the display is already what I want. It's 2D. Now let's, when you have a scalar field, you can also use a filter called warp to elevate that two-dimensional data as a function of the scalar data underneath. So this filter is called warp. We're going to use it here. Filter, search, warp, warp by scalar. That's it. I think a, a good scaling factor is 30. There we go. Oops. I need to switch to three-dimensional viewing. I need to reset my screen. And there, basically, I could augment that a little bit to show off. There we go. 
there's my two-dimensional data warped into 3D space. And I can add more things to it, more things to my visualization. I could also do different scenarios and then save different Python script and then play one or the other. With Paraview 5.4, I'm going to need, I need to load the Catalyst script generator plugin. So in tools, manage plugins menu, you go to this interface and you say load the Catalyst script generator plugin. At this time, we have two new menus, the writers and the co-processing menu, the top level menu. And I'm going to use the export state for that particular visualization, export state. There is my interface. I can't see the bottom of the screen. There we go. Next. So my source is Jacobi XMF. That's actually the name that shows up on the graphical user interface here. This is a name. It's not it's the name of the proxy. It's not the file name. I'm going to add this to my pipeline. Here I have a single input, so I, I proceed. By default, I call this object input, and this will be the string name I refer to in my coprocessor script. So don't, but the default is good, we don't change it. It's called input. And here we choose different flags. Do we want to enable live visualization? Why not? Do we want to output the components in the view? Yes. And we have a menu to choose the file formats, PNG, TIFF, JPEG, etc. The image string, the frequency, the magnification. And we're good with that. And the, the amount of paddings, we can say five for the file names. And we're done. We'll write a file, a script. Let's call it script.py. There. And I can basically quit now. And I have a script called script.py with pretty much the same things as the original script. A, my standard Paraview import uh, statements, my standard create view, register the view. There is my source of data, the Jacobi XMF, that's the Python name for the object. This is the producer of data. And it's called input as a string. And now we warp by scalar. And as input, we use the previous object. So this is my pipeline, the data source, the data filter. We warp using the attribute temperature. The scale factor is 60. So you can play with that, get different scaling factors. Same as before, we get a color transfer function for temperature. And then we show, that's the standard Paraview command to show any object. We show the object in the render view. We color by temperature. And the rest is the glue. Now, small change to the original coprocessor state. We now have two objects. We have the pseudo color map itself, and then we have the warped object. So this is why we have an array now of two objects with a frequency of update of one and one. We could change that to save only every other 100 iterations, for example. The rest is as before, except here I enabled true. 
and I'm going to do the final test. I'll cross my fingers to see. Hope it's going to work just fine. I'm going to run the catalyst, the instrumented version of the solver, using minus script Python. I'm going to start a new window. So I need to, to downsize here so you can see things. Module load Paraview. Uh, I can start Paraview already and show you. There's Paraview. In the Catalyst menu, I have the Connect button. So Connect, whoops, Connect. It's going to say, I'm waiting for a connection on port 222. I'll say OK. And here I run my initialize. And there it is. I have it already connected. I see the warp by scalar filter. I see my input. And all I need to do is actually make them active into the current GUI. And I do this by clicking on, those, on this particular icon here. And I need to make it visible there, color it by temperature, and switch to 2 or 3D, and I have it here. And I'm updating. I should be updating at every time step. But because this is pretty slow going, maybe the output is not obvious. So we've connected live now to the simulation. We're still dumping images on the disk uh, because this was not uh, turned off. And we can now elaborate on the visualization, do additional filters, add additional filters to the pipeline, and see the result on the screen. I think that makes the complete uh, trip through the in situ uh, connection. I'll stop here and Whoops, I have a little, uh, a little uh, initialization problem here. And my images are still there, as you see. So at the same time I was doing live, I was also dumping images. Now, dumping images is one thing. Oftentimes, we, it's also interesting to dump what we called this morning extracts, simplified reduced version of the data, or for example, an ISO surface itself could be saved, not as an image, but as a, as a geometric object. So you can reload it later. Still, you save, uh, you save a lot of IO. <coughs> Excuse me. Because usually, the downstream, as you go downstream your pipeline, the dimensionality and the size of your data is greatly reduced. All right. Let me recap. We've taken a simulation code, MPI enabled, standalone. It writes simulation output to disk. We've interfaced that to LibSim. We connected live with LibSim. And at that time, we could add any filters to the pipeline. So we did the pseudo color map, we did the histogram, we did the isocon tool, and Visit was able to generate the data from scratch. Uh, what I mean is without the need for an initial Python code. I also demonstrate to you the syntax of that Python code for a specific filter and plot. And I told you, those would be the key words to use in the Sensei interface. We will do this tomorrow as we progress in difficulty through the, the tutorial. We will use those keywords to generate visit objects and visualization. We cleaned up our cache. 
we recompiled our simulation, this time with the Catalyst API. We demonstrated how, by reusing a coprocessor Python code, we could already launch our simulation, dump images to code. I showed you briefly how you would insert into that Python code additional filters using the standard Paraview syntax, which you will incrementally learn. So we could augment the pipeline. And then finally, I showed you that using a representative version of your data set, most likely at lower resolution, you do a quick lightweight visualization, you build up a pipeline, once you like it, catalyst from inside Paraview writes the coprocessor script for you. And that is what you feed to your high resolution run the next time around. Okay? Does that make the complete loop, the complete vision? Now, disadvantage is that I did the exercise two times. I wrote an interface for the API of Libsyn. Second time around, I wrote the interface for the Catalyst API. Sensei will resolve that by using a unique API where we write, we make the effort of writing the data interface once and then we use multiple backends at one time. There. Anything to add to this? No, I think no? you did a great job. Good. Uh, 226. Well, wow, it's right on uh, time because we have coffee break now, right? Is that a good time now? Yeah, perfect. Coffee time, questions, whatever. Okay? Well, let's do one question here in front of the video. Yeah. Like change the conditions on the fly. Oh, you mean feed the, da ah, the data okay. back into the simulation. Um, currently, that's not possible. However, that's something that's being developed under the Sensei project. Um, and we, on Sensei, we have folks from Kitware. We have Andy Bauer and Utkarsh mm -hmm. Ayashit and Patrick O'Leary on the team. <coughs> and they'll be handling that part of uh, Paraview. <laughs> Uh, the pair of you side of it anyways. So we want to add bi-directionality to Sensei so that one can send data both ways. However, the, the Viz backend has to be capable of that too. So we have the Kitware folks to do that for pair of you and we have Brad Whitlock to do that for Visit. In the, in the, sorry, I turned that off. In Visit, there is, a, there is let's say, a primitive example of this feedback with an example uh, which Brad had written. Uh, the example is called AMR.C. I think the source code is, is a, a simulation where you can change the number of, of levels of your AMR dist uh, partitioning and the number of, uh, the number of grid resolution refinement at each level. This is yeah, a primitive example of the idea of using the GUI on the VIS side to feedback information to update the solver itself. So it's certainly an issue that is very dear to all of us as a, as a development project. So it, more will come in that direction. And I think that illustrates too that the, the interfaces to visit are very sophisticated and rich uh, versus the catalyst is very kind of simple and bare bones. So, you know, like that, yep. that feedback already exists in yep. visit to some yep. extent. Yeah, yeah. So, and you know, that's one of the challenges we face with Sensei is, you know, you have these different tools with different needs and requirements. Um, but we're actually trying to learn the best practices from all of them, you know, into our interface. So we can benefit from the experiences of like the visit side where they have this very rich metadata and it helps you to be extremely efficient. In all cases, the common denominators are two, the VTK data model and Python as a glue. Okay, let's go drink some coffee. <laughs>